Hey everyone, welcome back to another lesson. This lesson is on acute pyelonephritis. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what this condition is, what causes it, some of the pathophysiology behind why it occurs. We're also going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So what is acute pyelonephritis? Acute pyelonephritis is a bacterial infection involving inflammation of the kidney. So it is a bacterial infection of the kidney causing inflammation. And we can see it in the word pyelonephritis. Itis means inflammation. The prefix nef or nephro means kidney and pylo refers to the renal pelvis, which is this area of the kidney here. Acute pyelonephritis is actually one of the more common conditions involving the kidney. And there's something known as chronic pyelonephritis. We're not going to talk about chronic pyelonephritis in this lesson, but it occurs almost exclusively in children who have major anatomical abnormalities in their kidney or renal system. So from now on, I'm going to refer to acute pyelonephritis simply as pyelonephritis. What is the epidemiology of this condition? It occurs more often in females, and we can see that in the estimated annual rate of cases. So for females, it's 15 to 17 cases per 10,000 per year, and that compares to three to four cases per 10,000 in males. The groups that are most at risk for getting acute pyelonephritis include young sexually active females, who are the most at risk group. Pregnant patients are also at an increased risk, and patients with kidney stones have an increased risk of infection as well. Now that we know some of those key facts, let's talk about the pathophysiology of pyelonephritis. So there's actually two mechanisms of spread to the kidneys. One of them is through hematogenous spread. Hematogenous means it is spreading from the blood. So this is actually an uncommon way that the kidney can be infected, and it's more likely to occur in immunocompromised patients or patients with issues with their immune system. So hematogenous spread is through the blood, usually from another infection at a different site, and that infection can get into the blood, and that infection can go to the kidney through the bloodstream. And the second mechanism by which an infection can get to the kidneys and cause pyelonephritis is by an ascending urinary tract infection. So before I talk about the exact route by which this happens, let's just briefly talk about the anatomy of the renal system. So here is the kidney, and the kidney filters and produces urine that flows down the ureters to the bladder. So here's the bladder here, and then eventually the urine is expelled out of the body through the urethra. So that is the brief overview of the anatomy here. So how does a bacterial infection cause pyelonephritis? So what happens is that there's a bacterial infection of the urethra. So bacteria adhere to the urethra and slowly climb up the urethra. Once the bacteria reach the bladder, this is classically known as a urinary tract infection. We can call this cystitis as well. So cystitis means inflammation of the bladder. And then the bacteria can then continue to climb up the ureters, and eventually lead to the kidneys, which can lead to acute pyelonephritis at that point. So again, in women, the urethra is shorter than in men. So this is one reason why women are more at risk for having urinary tract infections in general, but also having pyelonephritis because they have a shorter urethra. So the bacteria don't have to climb as much to get into the system in general. So that was a brief overview of the mechanism by which an ascending urinary tract infection can lead to acute pyelonephritis. So what is the exact cause of acute pyelonephritis in most cases? So we talked about this before, but it is a bacterial infection, but more specifically, the causes are generally gram-negative bacteria. And the most common causative organism is E. coli, which is a gram-negative rod. Other common causative organisms of acute pyelonephritis include proteus bacteria, Klebsiella, and Enterobacter. And there's a way to remember these four bacteria that cause acute pyelonephritis, and that is by the mnemonic KEEP, K-E-E-P, K for Klebsiella, E for E. coli, E for Enterobacter, and P for proteus. Now that we know the pathophysiology behind acute pyelonephritis, what are some of the clinical features of this condition? First, I want to mention that symptoms often develop rather quickly. They can develop over hours or over the course of a day. And what we do find in this condition is the following. Fever and chills, which makes sense. This is an infection, and it's an infection of the kidney, so it's a rather severe infection. And we can also see flank pain. So the kidneys are located in the area of the back around here, so it's usually on the back at the lower edge of where your rib cage ends. So 
your kidneys being infected can lead to flank or back pain. And these are actually the two most common features of acute pyelonephritis. And what's very, very important to note here is that with acute pyelonephritis, we see what we call costovertebral angle pain or tenderness. And how to assess for this is by the following. Tapping on your back in the location of the kidney, which is on the back and at the lower edge of your rib cage. So if the clinician taps on your back and you feel tenderness in that location, that is very suggestive of acute pyelonephritis, especially when you have other symptoms as well. We can also see nausea and vomiting occurring with acute pyelonephritis. And along with the nausea and vomiting, we can see anorexia, so a loss of appetite. And then we can also see symptoms of cystitis or symptoms of a urinary tract infection because most times acute pyelonephritis occurs by an ascending urinary tract infection. And symptoms of a UTI include urgency, frequency, and dysuria. So urgency is when you really feel like you have to use the bathroom very quickly. There's an increased frequency of times by which you urinate per day. And then dysuria is a burning sensation during urination. There are also some atypical symptoms of pyelonephritis. These are less common to occur. These include epigastric pain. So epigastric pain is in the center of your abdomen above your belly button, so in this area here. And then there's also some lower abdominal pain that can occur as well, so you can get pain in this area here. Some other features of pyelonephritis occur in severe cases, and these include bacteremia, so bacteria in the blood. This can lead to sepsis and shock. There can also be multiple organ system dysfunction and even acute renal failure. So acute pyelonephritis can lead to very severe outcomes, including sepsis, shock, multiple organ system dysfunction, acute renal failure. And then I also want to briefly talk about uncomplicated and complicated acute pyelonephritis. So uncomplicated and complicated acute pyelonephritis are important because this can often determine whether a patient needs certain management or not. If any of the following are present in the patient, so these are patient characteristics, if, if the patient has any of these characteristics, it is considered complicated acute polynephritis. So it's a complicated acute polynephritis if there's any of the following. If the patient is pregnant, if the patient has uncontrolled diabetes, if the patient has kidney failure, if the patient is a kidney transplant recipient, if they are immunocompromised, extremes of age, so very young children, very old adults, and male patients as well. So these are characteristics that define whether a patient has uncomplicated or complicated acute pyelonephritis. Diagnosis of acute pyelonephritis can often occur by clinical examination. So if there's flank pain, if there's costovertebral angle tenderness, if there's fever and chills, these are highly suggestive of acute pyelonephritis. And then laboratory investigations are also important for diagnosis. These include urinalysis, pyuria, so pus in the urine, is a very important finding as this is present in almost all patients. Bacteria, so bacteria in the urine is also another finding. Urine culture can also be performed to see what the bacterial species is. Imaging is often not required for diagnosis. So a lot of these clinical findings and some of these laboratory findings put together lead to a clinician diagnosing this condition. So once it is diagnosed, how do clinicians treat it? Rehydration is very important. Oftentimes these patients have issues with nausea and vomiting and they're not drinking a lot of fluids, so it's important to rehydrate them as acute renal failure can occur. So you want to make sure that they don't have an extra acute kidney injury on top of everything else. And the mainstay of treatment is antibiotics. These are often taken for 7 to 14 days. Oral fluoroquinolones can be used. So oftentimes ambulatory care or these oral antibiotics will be used for uncomplicated cases. If the case is a complicated acute pyelonephritis, it's oftentimes done in hospitals, so they're hospitalized patients, and hospitalized patients will oftentimes receive intravenous antibiotics, so IV ceftraxone may be an example, IV piptazo may be an example, or IV fluoroquinolones. Fluoroquinolones may be avoided as use can breed fluoroquinolone resistance, so I just want to mention that here. So oftentimes, hospitalized patients may be started on some of these antibiotics, and then once culture and sensitivities come back, they will be narrowed, the spectrum will be narrowed to another antibiotic that is effective against that particular bacteria that is causing this infection. So if you want to learn more about other kidney diseases, please check out my nephrology playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.